So first of all, you guys know that a community is um, going to be all of the different populations, so all the different species that are living in the same place at the same time, right? And um, the way that a community uh, works is it's going to, again, need to have more species in it. And the way that we describe that is um, with uh, the term biodiversity, right? So biodiversity means the number of species in a, oops, the number of species in a specific community. Now, biodiversity is good for the community, right? Because um, uh, we say that the, the greater the biodiversity, the more robust a community is, or the more able it is to deal with change, okay? The greater the biodiversity, the more robust the community is. Okay, and so um, the way that this works is, let's say there's a there's a community and um, it's got some really good grass that grows there, like like uh, it grows really fast and has a lot of nutritional value and stuff like that. And um, so that's really the only primary producer there is this grass. And so there's all kinds of things that eat the grass, uh, and then there's all kinds of things that eat the things that eat the grass, and, and that uh, is what the entire community then sort of subsists on. And uh, then uh, there's a parasite that comes in and it, and it attacks the grass, and then the grass slowly dies off, right? Well, everything that would eat the grass then dies, and everything that would eat the stuff that ate the grass dies, right? And so then the entire community collapses because they would only had one specific type of primary producer. But if you were in a community that had hundreds of different types of primary producers, it doesn't matter if a parasite comes in and wipes out just one of those because it's likely that the community will be fine because there's other primary producers there that then um, the community could rely on. And this exists in all different levels of the food chain. Uh, the greater the amount of species, the greater the number of the species that are, are in that community, the more robust or able to deal with these changes and problems uh, that community will be. So it's good for the community as a whole. It's bad for the individual species though, right? Because um, for an individual species, biodiversity means greater interspecific competition. Increased biodiversity leads to greater interspecific competition. And what you might not know is that um, competition is always bad, no matter what. So um, we generally think of a competition as having like a winner and a loser, and we generally think, okay, for the winner it's good, and for the loser it's bad. But in actuality, as far as biology is concerned, um, it is always a bad thing to compete, and that's because if you're competing, you're spending some of your energy on that competition, and therefore you're not spending all of your energy on reproducing, and that means that you are in turn less fit. Right? Because the most fit organism is going to spend all their energy on reproduction so that they can then produce the most offspring for the next generation. Because that's how we measure biological fitness, right? So um, we can say that um, organisms will always benefit from avoiding competition. Even if they were the ones that would have won the competition, they're still better off avoiding it in the first place. Okay, And so the way that they do that is by occupying um, something that we call an ecological niche. Okay, So if an organism occupies a unique niche, that is going to allow it to avoid competition. A unique ecological niche.
okay? And a niche is essentially just like a set of behaviors. Okay, so where does it live? How does it act? Does it hunt in the daytime? Does it hunt in the nighttime? Does it hunt on the riverbed? Does it um, hunt for insects that are on the surface of the ground? Does it burrow into the ground? Um, does it uh, peck away at the wood and bark of a tree to get to the insects that are inside of the tree? What, what's it doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That's how we define something's ecological niche. And the whole reason why ecological niches are important is because of something that's called resource partitioning. Okay, so um, partition means to divide up, right? And resource partitioning is when you have a specific resource in an ecosystem, like let's say insects, resource partitioning, okay? Let's say our example here is insects. There are different types of insects in a, in a uh, ecosystem, so you've got like, you know, ground insects. You've got flying insects. You've got like um, surface water insects. And the adaptations or the, the features that are going to be important for hunting each one of these insects are different, right? So let's talk, let's talk about humans. Let's imagine that humans are going to try to occupy a niche within an ecosystem and um, we're going to eat primarily insects, okay? Which ones of these insects are we going to be best at eating? Ground insects. Why? Because well, we walk on the ground, first of all. Second of all, we've got um, big muscular hands that are good for digging, so we could easily unearth some insects and eat those insects, right? Also, because we're pretty bad at the other stuff. We can't fly, so like uh, the only flying insects that we could get to are the ones that like flew down close to us and we'd have to like catch them, right? Um, we're not super good at, at swimming and we're really not good at floating, right? And so if you think about a duck or something like that that can float on the surface of the water and just sort of like peck at insects that are on the surface, right? That's probably a much easier way to get those surface insects than whatever way we could devise to do that. And so because each one of these has a adaptation that's associated with being able to be good at obtaining these types of insects, that means that they get partitioned out. So ground insects are going to be partitioned out to be eaten mostly by organisms that have muscular uh, front appendages that can dig down and get those things, those ground insects. Flying insects are obviously going to be eaten by um, not only uh, those organisms that can fly, but not only do you have to be able to fly, but you also have to be pretty agile in your, in your flying because uh, you have to be able to catch them in the air, right? Um, surface water insects, obviously those um, organisms that can float or swim very well are going to be better at um, catching surface water insects. And therefore, even though we can say that a number of different organisms within an ecosystem will eat insects, they're not necessarily going to compete over those insects because they're eating different subgroups of insects. What if there are two organisms that are eating ground insects or flying insects? Are they going to compete? Maybe. Not necessarily though. So uh, take birds and bats, for instance. They both eat flying insects. Birds eat the flying insects during the day. Bats eat the flying insects at night. There's probably a different subset of insects that are flying during the day and during the night, and therefore they are not likely competing over those insects, right? These sets of behaviors uh, that we include in their ecological niche, so part of like a bat's ecological niche is the fact that it's nocturnal, and so the reason why it's nocturnal is to avoid competition with the things that would be hunting for the same types of resources during the day. Make sense? Okay. Um, sometimes organisms will occupy uh, the same ecological niche, and that's uh, always bad. Sometimes organisms occupy same niche temporarily and I say temporarily because um, it can't last that long Temporary. Uh, because it can't last that long because um, 
one of those organisms is going to win the competition and one of them is going to lose the competition, right? And the loser is uh, going to have two options, right? They can either just die, right, and, and go extinct. And we call that being competitively excluded. Competitive exclusion. Or they can go and try to find some other niche somewhere else, right? And, and try to occupy an, an open niche somewhere else. What's that called when an organism leaves to go find another niche? Adaptation. Yeah, it's called adaptive radiation. So they go someplace else. And um, if they can't find anything else in the surrounding areas, it's likely that they'll just go extinct and they'll be competitively excluded. But uh, they're at least going to give it a shot and try to find somewhere else that they can live, uh, somewhere else where their um, specific subset of adaptations are going to be uh, useful to them. Okay. So uh, let's take a, a little break from that and let's talk about um, the roles within an ecosystem. Okay, so um, in any ecosystem or any community, um, we are going to be able to sort of give certain titles to specific species. Okay, so one of those titles is uh, probably one that you're familiar with called the apex predator. Okay, an apex means like at the top, right? And um, so an apex predator is going to be at the top of the food chain and it's going to be the one that is characterized by not having anything that really eats it right not not being preyed on by anything and then also it's going to be characterized by having the least amount of total biomass in that uh, specific community right so the top of the food chain so organism at the top of the food chain generally with the least biomass total in the community. Okay, so um, we're not talking about um, individual biomass. So like, let's say we're talking about like great white sharks or something like that. Um, there's not a lot of organisms in the ocean that are going to be like, ah, great white shark, that sounds like a great lunch item. I'm going to go capture and kill myself a great white shark, and that, I'm going to eat that for lunch. For a lot of different reasons. First of all, like, requires a lot of energy to kill a great white shark. Second of all, like, there's a pretty good chance that a great white shark is going to kill you when you're trying to kill it. And then third, uh, great white sharks are just not good eaten. And the reason why they're not good eaten is because they're at the top of the, uh, the food chain. And so there's the things like biomagnification. Biomagnification is the concept that toxins will build up in each successive uh, uh, rung of the food chain. And so once you get to the top, things like mercury have built up to the point where they're uh, pretty toxic, right? And the other reason is because sharks, uh, they store their urea, their, their nitrogenous waste in their muscles. And so uh, you can't really eat um, a, a shark that's you know over a certain size because it's got so much urea in its muscles that'll make you very, very sick, okay? Um, so let's say I took, what's up? Uh huh, because tuna is gi giant, right? So the bigger the fish, uh, the more stuff it's eaten, and the greater the amount of mercury in it. Yeah. Is it generally with least biomass because humans are an exclusion? Uh, humans are not necessarily an exclusion to this. Um, humans have a pretty low biomass uh, total, even though there's a ton of us. Um, our total biomass is like less than things like ants and crabs and things like that. Yeah. Um, is like the quality of the fish, um, doesn't it like change how much like mercury or anything is in it? Like, Not really. Like if it had a different diet or something farm-raised? Farm-raised absolutely would be less mercury. Um, wild-caught should have high mercury con or content, um, whereas farm-raised should have zero mercury content unless it's a really bad farm. Because they should be controlling what it's eating and they should be controlling the mercury content of the things that are eating. Okay. 
So, um, let's think about let's let's think about those great white sharks again. Um, I don't know how many great white sharks are in the ocean. It's like fifteen thousand. I don't know. That's a total estimation, right? So uh, let's say that there's thirty thousand tons of great white sharks total in the ocean, right? And um, then let's take the so so if we took every great white shark in the ocean and put it on a scale thirty thousand tons okay then we took all of the biomass of let's say phytoplankton right and we put that on the scale okay we would expect that to be like in the millions of tons right because like there's way more biomass of these uh, uh, phytoplankton than there is of the great white because the great white has to be at the very top of the food chain and every time you go up a, ra a rung on the food chain you lose like 90 percent of the energy from the previous level but we'll talk about that later so when we say that it has the least amount of biomass total you guys know that each great white shark is actually very large it's just that the number of great white shark is small right okay so the next one is probably the most misused misused out of all of them and um that is the dominant species And a dominant species sounds like it's going to be the same thing as the apex predator, right? So you think like, oh, great white sharks, they're pretty dominant. They dominate things, right? But that's actually not what this means at all. The dominant species is just the one with the most biomass, right? So generally, dominant species are going to be things like grass, right? And you don't think of grass as being like the dominant thing, but that's what it means, okay? So this is the organism with the most biomass and generally speaking we say that the organism with the most biomass is going to be um, a primary producer so usually a primary producer there's some exceptions to this um, there are some aquatic ecosystems where the amount of zooplankton, which is the animal-like plankton, is greater in quantity than the phytoplankton, but those are like exceptions to the rule, not, uh, not the usual rule, okay? Next, let's talk about keystone species. Again, this one is often misused. Um, people often talk about keystone species as being species that you'd only find in one specific type of community or ecosystem. Um, and sometimes that works out to be okay for a definition, but it's not the correct definition. The correct definition for a keystone species is a species that is required for the maintenance of the biodiversity of a community. In other words, if you remove those species, uh, if you remove the keystone species, the biodiversity of that community would plummet, right? Just removing one species might cause there to be a hundred less species in that community because they are maintaining it. They're maintaining the biodiversity. So a species required to maintain the biodiversity of a community. So this community here is um, called a kelp forest, right? Uh, and the kelp forest is, uh, obviously, the, the fact that it has kelp is pretty important because they named it a kelp forest. Uh, kelp is a macroalgae. It's like a really, 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 really big seaweed, and it grows really thick. And so in a kelp forest, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, requires kelp to be there, all kinds of um, fish that live within the kelp that need to use it for shelter, um, all kinds of crabs and stuff that feed off the kelp. Uh, and if you don't have the kelp, then you can't have this kelp forest community, right? One of the things that's in a kelp forest community is the sea urchin. And uh, sea urchins feed off the kelp. But unfortunately, sea urchins feed off a very specific part of the kelp that is called the holdfast, okay? So down at the very bottom of this large stalk of kelp, there is a, a, a part of it called the holdfast that sort of looks like roots that's holding it onto the seafloor. And that's the sea urchin's favorite thing to eat. Okay? So if it eats the holdfast, the entire stalk of kelp then uh, floats up to the surface, gets caught in the ocean's current and waves, and gets pushed on shore where it's no longer useful anymore and just decays and stuff like that. So all the stuff that was then relying on the kelp would not be able to live on that specific kelp stalk anymore. If the sea urchins go unchecked, 
then the kelp forest dies. Okay, they all get uh, their hold fast shoot up and they all float to the surface and they'll, that kelp forest won't be there anymore. So the keystone species in a kelp forest is the sea otter. Okay, so the reason why this is the keystone species is because the sea otter's main uh, uh, diet is the sea urchin. Okay, and so it swims down to the bottom, picks up the sea urchins that are on the ocean floor, and then it eats them. And so it keeps that sea urchin uh, population in check to the point where it can't destroy the kelp forest, and therefore the kelp forest can remain uh, intact. If you removed the sea otters from this uh, ecosystem, then the sea urchins would kill the kelp, and then that would cause the, the, uh, all the things that were living on the kelp to die, and so you would see the species diversity reduced significantly in that ecosystem because of the removal of one species, which is the sea otter. Make sense? So we say example of this would be the sea otter and the kelp forest because just removing the sea otter will um, cause the overall biodiversity to go significantly down. Okay? Let's talk about invasive species. So invasive species are non-native species and um, specifically they're non-native species that are actually go in and outcompete one of the native species. Okay? Non-native Sometimes non-native species are referred to as introduced species. That outcompete a native species. Okay? So there are lots of examples of this because we live in Florida and there's a ton of invasive species in Florida. Um, a really good example that you probably see every day are those, uh, those lizards that are always crawling around outside, right? Um, if you're looking at one of those lizards and it's brown, uh, there's a good chance that what you're looking at is called a Cuban brown anole. And the Cuban brown anole is an invasive from Cuba, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and the ones that are supposed to live here are the green ones, right? The green ones are native to Florida, the green anole. And um, unfortunately, the green anoles are being wildly outcompeted by the brown anoles, and that is because the green anoles have natural predators. They have things that feed off of them, and uh, so those things continue to feed off the green ones, and they kind of shy away from eating the brown ones as much. Uh, and so then, even though the green ones and the brown ones are occupying the same niche, the green ones are also being preyed upon, and therefore the brown ones have the competitive advantage and will end up uh, competitively excluding those green anoles eventually, right? So we're in the process now. If you went back 200 years and you walked around the Tampa Bay area, you would see a lot more of the green ones uh, and less of the brown ones. And now as time goes on, you'll see more and more and more of the brown ones until the green ones are just not there anymore, okay? Um, there's, uh, there's another type of um, non-native species that's not a problem. Um, that's just referred to as an exotic species. Okay, exotic species are um, non-native species that uh, don't outcompete anything. They're, they're either um, not able to outcompete the native species or they're occupying an open niche. Okay, non-native species that occupy an empty niche. Okay, so uh, an example of an exotic species, um, one of the biggest exports of Tampa, does anybody know what the biggest export of uh, Tampa is as far as um, uh, from our airport? What? What? Oranges? No. It's exotic fish. Tropical fish. Plant City has one of the largest fish, uh, tropical fish uh, hatcheries in the United States. And so we supply almost all of the United States with tropical fish and saltwater fish and stuff like that. Okay? So uh, a lot of times they escape. They get out of wherever we're, we're hatching them and they get into the ocean. And so like you'll see clownfish and stuff swimming around in the Atlantic Ocean. Problem is clownfish are not super good at living in the Atlantic Ocean. So like they're exotic, but they're not 
out competing anything. They're not, you know, taking the, the place of any native species. And so they're just like exotic species. We don't care that they're there because they're probably going to get out competed themselves and die, right? Okay. Uh, last thing, let's talk about the predator prey relationship. Um, predator prey relationships. We've talked about the um, whole uh, uh, predator uh, population is going to be um, related to the prey population and the prey population will go up and that's going to cause the predator population to go up, which then causes the prey population to go down. All those things, right? Um, but what we haven't talked about yet is the fact that it's just always bad for prey to be eaten. Right? No matter what, you don't want to get eaten because then you can't reproduce anymore. So um, prey adaptations, are a set of adaptations uh, that are there to stop prey from being eaten as much. Right. So if you come into uh, a situation where a predator is trying to eat you, uh, one of the options is to escape. Right. And so escape can happen in a lot of different ways, um, as long as you can do it better than your predator, right? So things like being able to run fast, or fly, or burrow, or jump, or climb. As long as you can do these things better than your predator, you are going to probably be safe most of the time. Okay, so this is a, the most common adaptation for prey is to just be fast or agile so that they don't get eaten in the first place, right? Um, even better than that is just not being seen. So the, the predator has no opportunity to eat you. So camouflage is good in that case. Uh, just avoid being seen in the first place. And the last one that you can have is just like, you don't want to eat me. Okay, because you're toxic. Toxins. And so there's two types of toxins. Um, there's what's called poison, right? Where if you eat that organism, you're probably going to get sick. And then there's another one called venom. And that's uh, toxins that are injected directly into the bloodstream um, and uh, then have some effect on the blood. Okay, so uh, something that is poisonous is not necessarily venomous. Something that's venomous is not necessarily poisonous. Uh, so normally, along with these things, it's also useful to have warning coloration because this stops you from getting eaten, right? Well, maybe it doesn't stop you from getting eaten, but it stops that same uh, predator from then eating another member of your species, right? So if I go around and I eat something that's bright yellow and then it makes me super sick, as a predator, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't eat that bright yellow stuff anymore because it made me super sick, okay? That's what warning coloration is. That's the whole idea behind it. Um, and then along with warning coloration, you have this concept that's called mimicry. And mimicry is sort of the ultimate uh, of biological fitness because mimics are going to act like they are toxic, right? But they're not toxic. So they look just like the toxic organisms, but they don't have to spend the resources on being toxic, right? So looking like a toxic organism to avoid being eaten. Okay, so for instance, uh, here are two snakes. On the left, uh, this one has a red band next to a black band. So that means that this is a, uh, a scarlet king snake, right? And then over here, this has a black band next to a uh, yellow, yellow band. And so this is a coral snake. The coral snake over here is extremely venomous. The king snake is not venomous at all. Okay, there's a saying that says red to black, venom lack, red to yellow, kill a fellow, right? So uh, I know the, that, that saying, right? But it's unlikely that an organism that's living in this environment will be like, oh, is that the poisonous one? Can I eat that? Red to yellow, kill a fellow, red to black, venom lack. They can't really remember the saying. And so they're just like, oh, it's got red and black stripes. I'm just going to stay away from it because it might kill me, right? 
This is called Batesian mimicry, where one non-venomous uh, organism looks like a venomous organism. Uh, there's also another one called Mullerin, Mullerin mimicry, and what that means is that all organisms that have the same type of toxin look the same. So if you think about bees, bees often have um, yellow and black stripes, and they are able to sting you, right? So are wasps related to honeybees? Sure, distant, distantly related, yes. But they can both sting you, and they both have the same coloration, and that coloration is just a way to alert you, hey, I can sting you if I want, right? I have the exact same coloration as the other stuff that stings, and so you want to stay away. There are also bees that have that coloration that can't sting you, and guess what? They are going through Batesian mimicry where they're saying, hey, there's lots of stuff that has these red and yellow stripes, so just having the red and yellow stripes is sometimes enough for us to not be eaten or for things to stay away from us. Right? Make sense? All right, that's it.